Hi, hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay, it's an important topic. Many questions have been asked. So in this part one, we are going to talk about the questions, the relevant anatomy because that is important to understand the uh, symptoms, how the symptoms and signs come. Okay, and what will be your uh, investigation modalities and treatment approach okay so we are going to talk about etiopathogenesis in this part part one okay so what does the name suggest juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma juvenile means that it is a child or a young person we can say second decade of life between 11 to 20 years of age nasopharynx means it is arising from the nasopharynx angiofibroma means it is a benign tumor which is made up of blood vessels and fibrous tissue angio means blood vessels angio means blood vessels and fibroma means it is made up of fibrous tissue okay so that is uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma juvenile means it is a small child a young adult uh, not a small child, sorry, it's a young adult. Uh, nasopharynx arising from the nasopharynx. Angiofibroma means it is made up of blood vessels and fibrous tissue. Okay. Coming to the questions. So, what are the questions that are asked here? What these are the previous year questions? The first one is describe the etiopathogenesis, clinical features, management of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So, he has given two marks for etiopathogenesis, he has given two marks for clinical features and he has given six marks for management. So when you say clinical features, we include symptoms and signs. If we add these two symptoms and signs, it becomes clinical features. Management means, it means investigations and treatment. These two, if you add together, it becomes a management. So he's giving more marks for the management of this uh, tumor. Okay, second question, uh, another question, which has come previously. How do you manage a 12 year old boy? So. He didn't give the uh, diagnosis here. He is giving one of the features. 12 year old boy who has presented with epistaxis, intermittent epistaxis with nasal obstruction. So when you say it's a 12 year, boy, 12 year old boy, so it is an adolescent age group. This disease is seen almost exclusively in males. And the chief complaint, the most important presenting feature is usually intermittent epistaxis with nasal obstruction. So two marks for etiopathogenesis, two marks for clinical features, two marks for uh, uh, investigations, four marks for the treatment of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Sometimes you can also get a short question from this, symptoms of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Uh, this is a four mark question. Uh, so sometimes you can get simply like two marks question, you have to just describe what is nasopharyngeal, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay. Coming to the relevant anatomy. So what uh, if you know about this, this is a little bit of a complicated anatomy. Uh, you have to know about the spinopalatine foramen. You have to know about the spinopalatine fossa and the various connections that this spinopalatine fossa has or the relation of the spinopalatine fossa to the various structures so that you will understand the root of, uh, of this juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. And uh, because of the spread, what are the symptoms and the signs that this patient is going to have and what are the signs and symptoms with which he is going to present to you so that you can suspect that this is a case of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and take the necessary steps. So this is present in the nasopharynx. So we are going to talk about the nasopharynx. The most important structure that we see right off the bat, as you say, right of it, you will see the opening of the eustachian tube. Okay, this is the opening of the eustachian tube. Where is the eustachian tube located? It is located 1 cm behind the posterior end, 1.25 cm posterior to the posterior end of inferior turbinate. So this is the inferior turbinate. This is the eustachian tube opening. The distance between the posterior end of the inferior turbinate and the eustachian tube opening is 1.25 cm. Okay, now coming to spinopalatine foramen, the other important structure in the nasopharynx, which is of importance to us in this topic. So this is the spinopalatine foramen. So this is the spinopalatine foramen. So where is the spinopalatine foramen located? So this is the middle turbinate. Okay, so middle turbinate, it is present one centimeter posterior to the posterior end of middle turbinate. So what does the spinopalatine fossa, so sorry, foramen do? It connects the spinopalatine uh, fossa, it connects the spinopalatine fossa with the nasopharynx. So this is the nasopharynx and just behind this bone, uh, you will find the 
स्पिनोपैलेटाइन फोजा तो स्पिनोपैलेटाइन फोजा इज कनेक्टेड टू द नेसो फैरिंग्स थ्रू द स्पिनोपैलेटाइन फोरामिन लोकेशन वेयर इज दिस स्पिनोपैलेटाइन फोजा लोकेटेड स्पिनोपैलेटाइन फोजा इज लोकेटेड पोस्टीरियर टू द मैक्सिलरी एंट्रम सो दिस इज द पोस्टीरियर वॉल ऑफ द मैक्सिलरी एंट्रम दिस इज द एंटीरियर वॉल ऑफ द मैक्सिलरी एंट्रम दिस इज द ऑर्बिट ओके is the orbit and this is the superior wall of the of the maxillary sinus or the maxillary antrum this is the inferior wall this is the alveolus through which the teeth are attached attached here so uh, spinopalatine fossa is located just posterior to the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum so how can you reach the uh, spinopalatine fossa you can make a sublabial incision under the lip you can go into that you can make an opening in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus you will be inside the maxillary sinus then after that you can open the posterior wall you can make an opening in the wall of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus from there you can enter into the spinoid sinus uh, sorry uh, spinopalatine uh, uh, fossa this is one of the approaches to the spinopalatine fossa if you have to reach that part for the removal of the disease cardiac approach this uh, sublabial incision making an opening in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus is called the cardiac approach okay what does spinopalatine fossa contain spinopalatine fossa contains one this one the most important part as we can say okay the pterygopalatine ganglion it contains the maxillary nerve it contains the maxillary nerve and it contains the maxillary artery so maxillary artery is a branch of the external carotid artery it the 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 branch continues from the external carotid artery you have the maxillary artery maxillary artery gives the spinopalatine artery which is the most important artery which is supplying the nose it is also called the artery of epistaxis okay maxillary nerve we saw this this is the maxillary nerve so it is coming from the skull from the brain stem uh, and there you have the trigeminal ganglion and this is the second division of the trigeminal nerve it passes through the foramen rotundum we are going to talk about it in a short while uh, and uh, it uh, reaches the spinopalatine uh, fossa so it is the, the three structures that you see in the spinopalatine fossa one is spinopalatine ganglion second is the maxillary artery which is a branch of the external carotid artery and the maxillary nerve which is the second division of the trigeminal nerve the boundaries of spinopalatine fossa so spinopalatine fossa boundaries is important uh, so what is uh, present anteriorly we just talked about it this uh, is the uh, i'm i'm outlining the pterygomaxillary fissure this is the temporal area of the skull okay this is the orbit okay now this is the maxillary sinus okay so this is the maxillary sinus so just anterior boundary of the pterygopalatine fossa or the spinopalatine fossa is the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum posteriorly posteriorly you have the pterygoid plates so these are the pterygoid plates okay in the pterygoid plates you will have two openings one is the foramen rotundum through which the maxillary nerve enters the fossa the another opening is the foramen leading to the pterygoid canal so you have the pterygoid canal it is also called the nerve of the pterygoid canal median nerve median nerve is called the nerve of the pterygoid canal and uh, through this foramen the pterygoid canal has a foramen the foramen leads into the pterygopalatine fossa and so the median nerve enters the fossa through this foramen medially medially uh, this is the medial medial aspect this is the medial you know you're looking at the pterygopalatine fossa from medially okay from inside the nose so medially you have the nasal cavity the the lateral wall of the nasopharynx this is the lateral wall of the nasopharynx so that forms the medial boundary of the pterygopalatine fossa laterally uh, it opens into the infratemporal fossa so this is the temporal region so this pterygomaxillary fissure so here inside you have the spinopalatine fossa from the spinopalatine fossa you enter into this this space that is present under the temporal area it's called the infratemporal fossa okay it enters into the infratemporal fossa so laterally it opens into the infratemporal fossa via the pterygomaxillary fissure this opening that is present laterally through which the spinopalatine fossa enters into the infratemporal fossa is called the pterygomaxillary fissure 
the floor you have this little bit of change in color right this is this uh, pink colored bone that is present inferiorly is the palatine bone okay so it is formed by the palate floor is formed by the palate one important relation there is the greater palatine artery so you have a palatine canal through which the greater palatine artery which is a branch of the maxillary artery in the spinal palatine fossa enters into the palate and supplies the palate okay roof so the roof of this pterygopalatine fossa is formed by the floor of the orbit the structure that is present in between these two for the passage of the various structures is the inferior orbital fissure also called the infraorbital fissure floor of the orbit so anteriorly you have the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum posterior you have the pterygoid plates okay uh, medially you have the lateral wall of the nasopharynx laterally it is in relation to the infratemporal fossa to the pterygomaxillary fissure floor is formed by the palate the roof is formed by the uh, floor of the orbit okay now coming to this, this is a 3d view i have shown you that is the that is you are looking at it from laterally and medially now you are looking at the right side of right this is the right pterygopalatine fossa you are looking posteriorly so this is the posterior suppose you go from behind through the skull if you could go to the pterygo pterygoid plate area and you can look at the posterior wall so this is what it looks like it is an inverted pyramid sci kind of a structure so this is the medial aspect of the pterygopalatine fossa okay from where it goes into the nasal cavity through the spinopalatine foramen it goes laterally into the infratemporal fossa through the pterygomaxillary fissure so the whole thing is the pterygomaxillary fissure posteriorly as we said we have a foramen rotundum and the pterygoid canal through which the maxillary nerve enters and through which the median nerve enters into the spinopalatine fossa superiorly we have the roof uh, the roof of the uh, the roof of the spinopalatine fossa which is the other thing is the floor of the orbit it uh, the 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 perfect the fissure that is connecting these two structures the orbit uh, the orbit and the spinopalatine fossa is the inferior orbital fissure and anterior wall is the posterior wall of maxillary antrum which we talked about posterior wall of maxillary antrum so i think it is clear now this is the posterior wall you have two openings inferior wall so i did not talk about inferior wall is formed by the palate where you have the palatine canal through which the greater palatine artery enters into the palate so this is the lateral aspect this is the medial aspect the the, the face that is pointing towards you that is the posterior wall of the spinopalatine fossa this is the floor of the spinopalatine fossa you cannot see the anterior wall anterior wall of the spinopalatine fossa this is the roof of the spinopalatine fossa okay now what is the importance of spinopalatine fossa of the spinopalatine foramen because you cannot see the spinopalatine for fossa through the nasal cavity but you can reach the spinopalatine foramen one is the spinopalatine artery which is a branch of the maxillary artery as i said it is the main artery of the nose it is also called the artery of epistaxis so in a case of severe epistaxis patient is having bleeding severe bleeding you try to do an anterior nasal packing and you do a posterior nasal packing after doing this anterior nasal pack and a posterior nasal pack bleeding is not getting controlled not getting controlled then you go endoscopically you try to locate this spinopalatine foramen which is present 1 cm behind the posterior end of the inferior turbinate you you try to locate the spinopalatine artery and you ligate it and that's how you can control the epistaxis suppose you have done this you put a clip on the spinopalatine artery but still the bleeding is not getting out next step will be to go into the spinopalatine fossa you have to ligate the maxillary artery here in the spinopalatine fossa the other important uh, clinical importance of the spinopalatine foramen it is the most common site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so this is where initially they thought it was in the spinopalatine fossa now it is uh, clearly understood that the Uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma arises from the superior margin of the spinopalatine foramen incidence it is a very rare tumor okay uh, you have to believe me if you if i say that in the last 13 years of practice i have seen only two cases of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma it is so rare okay it is so rare uh, it forms only 0.05% of all tumors of head and neck head and neck tumors you know their most common will be ca carcinomas of the larynx 
then you'll have maxillary carcinomas, uh, other things. Uh, you'll also have benign tumors. So this forms only 0.05% of all tumors, benign and malignant of head and neck uh, tumors. It is so rare, 0.05%. Though it is only 0.05%, it is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx. It is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx. This is a neat PG question. Okay. This is the most common benign tumor. Benign tumor means there will be no metastasis. There will be no metastasis. You will not have metastasis to the liver or into the lung, etc. Those are metastasis, so you will not have them. This, this tumor will produce symptoms by local extension and destruction of whatever. Uh, structures that come in its way. Okay, etiopathogenesis. So, what causes this disease in these patients? Okay, because it is seen most exclu almost exclusively in males. The chance of you finding juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma in females is very remote. Nineteen of the cases you will find it in males, and that too in the second decade only. 11 to 20 years of age. The two cases that I saw, this was a classical presentation. Okay, adolescent males. So, because this disease is coming in males, because it is presenting in the second decade, the theory, the hormonal theory states that it may be, it may be, it is not confirmed, it may be, a, it may be a testosterone dependent tumor. So, there may be hematomatous nidus of uh, tissue which is present at birth in these patients uh, in the nasopharynx, okay, which gets activated when testosterone starts rising pre pubertally. So, at the time of adolescence, the this hematomatous nidus, which is there in the nasopharynx, gets activated by, by by testosterone and it starts developing into juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. This is a hormonal theory of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Site of origin. I've already talked about it. Site of origin, it arises from the superior margin of the spinopalatine foramen in the posterior part of the nasal cavity. Okay. So once it arises in the spinopalatine foramen, in the posterior part of the nasal cavity, superior margin of the spinopalatine foramen, the most easiest route of spread is into the nasal cavity medially. Most easy because that is where you have more space, right? Compared to pterygopalatine fossa, nasal cavity you have more space. So once it enters into the nasal cavity, and from there it uh, goes into the nasopharynx. So once it goes into the nasal cavity, there is a mass in the nasal cavity. So the patient will present with uh, unilateral nasal obstruction. Initially, it is unilateral. Then, as it starts growing, it becomes bilateral. Okay, and unilateral rhinorrhea. So, these are the symptoms with which the patient starts presenting once the tumor has extended medially into the nasal cavity. Okay. At this point also, I have already said it is a benign but locally invasive tumor because it starts destroying the adjacent structures anterior superiorly. Okay. So, you have the nose. Okay. You have the nose. You have the superior turbinate, middle turbinate, and the inferior turbinate. This is the this is the spinopalatine foramen. Anterior superiorly, what do you have here? This is the ethmoid sinus. Anteriorly, what do you have here? This is the maxillary sinus. So this is the ethmoid sinus and this is the maxillary sinus. So once it starts extending anterior superiorly, it starts invading into the ethmoid sinus and then into the maxillary sinus. And then just superior to it, you have the spinoid sinus. It invades this spinoid sinus also. So once it starts invading these three sinuses, then the, then the openings of the sinuses will get blocked, causing sinusitis. So what are the chief complaint in the case of sinusitis? It is headache. So the patient can present with headache. Okay. So this is uh, the anterior superior extension of the uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So we talked about uh, nasal cavity. We will talk about now going into the lateral extension. Lateral extension, this diagram shows it well. So this is the lateral wall of the nasopharynx, right? This is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. It starts growing laterally. So this is the pterygoid muscles that are present, which are the muscles of mastication. It starts infiltrating them, causing trismus. So this is one of the symptoms that we usually miss in a case of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. We do not think from where does the trismus come. Trismus comes because of the infiltration, infiltration of the pterygoid muscles, infiltration of the pterygoid muscles. So it infiltrates into the pterygoid muscles and causes trismus. So it starts extending into the first, it starts from the spinopalatine uh, foramen, it goes and fills up the spinopalatine fossa. From there, it goes into the cheek, infratemporal fossa, infratemporal fossa cheek. So it can present as a cheek swelling. It can present as a cheek swelling when it, when it enters into the infratemporal fossa and trismus. So once it has reached the infratemporal fossa, it will cause uh, cheek swelling and trismus. 
laterally it can go into the it can go into the nasopharynx area where it is going to block the eustachian tube opening causing deafness and otalgia that why does it cause deafness and otalgia because the eustachian tube is no longer able to function properly causing serous otitis media there may be fluid inside the uh, inside the tympan inside the middle ear cavity causing deafness and otalgia okay so extension of the tumor superiorly so this is the extension of the tumor this is the juvenile this is spinopalatine foramen this is the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so it can extend first it can extend into the spinoid sinus from there it can invade into the cella tersica cavernous sinus from there it can go into the middle cranial fossa okay uh, superiorly it can extend into the orbit we have talked about it it extend into the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure or the superior orbital fissure causing proptosis and decreased vision decreased vision is a very rare because very rare because this is a slow growing tumor and if it starts uh, stretching the optic nerve also it will not cause uh, uh, decreased vision or blindness right away the first thing that the patient is going to have is going to be proptosis because this uh, uh, orbit is there this is the optic nerve entering this is the Uh, eyeball with its uh, various muscles. So once this the space is very less, once this uh, tumor got starts growing into the orbit, the patient is going to have proptosis. The eye starts getting bulged outwards and laterally. Okay, so that the patient have proptosis in the later stages where the tumor has invaded into the orbit, or you can say. Once the patient has proptosis, you can be pretty sure that the tumor has already invaded into the orbit. So superiorly, it can extend into the middle cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa extension is more common than the anterior cranial fossa extension. So how does it enter into the middle cranial fossa? First thing is the floor of the middle cranial fossa. It can directly extend into the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Floor of the middle cranial fossa. It can extend through it, or it can extend through the spinoid sinus into the cavernous sinus into the middle cranial fossa. So once it is there in the cavernous sinus, it starts. Uh, uh, Putting pressure on the nerves that are present in the cavernous sinus, that is the third nerve, the fourth nerve, and the sixth nerve, the muscles which move the eye, right? So these uh, uh, nerves can also get affected. This is a late presentation. This is a very late presentation of this tumor. So anterior cranial fossa. How does it get into the anterior cranial fossa? As I already said, it, the tumor will extend anterior superior into the ethmoid sinus. It, the roof of the ethmoid sinus is very thin. It is especially thin at the uh, cribriform plate through which it can enter into the anterior cranial fossa, uh, but uh, middle cranial fossa extension because this is present mostly posteriorly, just below the middle cranial fossa. So middle cranial fossa extension is more common than anterior cranial fossa extension. But you should know how it extends into the anterior cranial fossa. It can basically enter into the ethmoid sinus. From the ethmoid sinus, it can grow superiorly through the cribriform plate, ethmoid. So this is an MRI scan of this patient. This is this whole thing is a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay, this whole thing is a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So this is the spinoid uh, spinopalatine fossa. This is the uh, lateral extension into the uh, into the infratemporal fossa. This is the middle cranial fossa extension. It is already breached. This is the uh, see this is here. This is this is where should be the middle cranial fossa border. It is already extended beyond that. It has extended into the spinoid sinus and about to breach this part of the middle cranial fossa, and this is the entire tumor. So this is how you can, by seeing the MRI, you can know the soft tissue extension of the tumor. Once the patient has increased intracranial pressure symptoms, once the tumor has got it gone into the uh, cranial fossa, it can start increasing the intracranial pressure, causing the symptoms of headache and vomiting. Headache and vomiting means you can expect that this tumor is already crossed into the uh, intracranial cavity, and now it is going to be really tough to cure this patient. Thank you. So this is the end of part one. So we have finished the uh, questions that come here. We uh, we talked about what the name suggests. We talked about the relevant anatomy. You know. Uh, the spinopalatine foramen, where is it? Where is the spinopalatine fossa? What are the various extensions of the spinopalatine fossa? Laterally into the infratemporal fossa, medially into the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, superiorly into the roof of the orbit, inferiorly uh, through the palatine, through the palate, through the floor of the uh, floor the, formed by the palate. Posteriorly the pterygoid plates, and anteriorly the posterior wall of the maxillary antrum. 
and then uh, we talked about the importance of this spinopalatine fossa and spinopalatine foramen. We talked about the contents, what are present in the spinopalatine foramen. Then we talked about the etiopathogenesis, seen mostly in males in the second decade of life. Uh, because of that, we think that this is testosterone dependent. Depo there may be a hematomatous nidus which gets activated because of testosterone. Then we said, where does it extend into? Once it extends into the nasal cavity, it presents with unilateral nasal obstruction and unilateral rhinorrhea. Later, it presents bilateral nasal obstruction. Laterally, it can extend into the infratemporal fossa, causing cheek swelling, causing uh, uh, trismus because of uh, infiltration of the pterygoid muscles. Okay, uh, it can extend anterior superiorly into the uh, ethmoid sinus and uh, maxillary sinus, and superiorly into the spinoid sinus, causing blockade of this uh, openings of the sinuses, causing sinusitis. Then, then what did we say? Uh, laterally, medially, anterior superiorly. Uh, then it can go into the into the you know, superiorly from the orbits. Uh, it can extend into the orbit causing proptosis and decreased vision. It can enter into the middle cranial fossa through the spinoid sinus or the roof uh, to the floor of the middle cranial fossa. It can extend into the anterior cranial fossa also through the um, ethmoid sinus, roof of the ethmoid sinus or the cribriform plate. And because of these extensions, what are the various symptoms that you produce? So these are basically going to be the clinical features which we are going to talk about in part two. Thank you everyone for the patient listening.